everyone, I'm Darrell Heath with UA Little Rock's College of Arts, Letters, and Sciences. Welcome to the night sky. It's always a bit magical being outside on a clear, dark night and looking up at all those glittering stars. It's made all the more magical when from out of nowhere there appears a sudden streak of light that flashes for a brief moment and then is gone. Some folks call these transient flashes of light either shooting or falling stars, and as kids, we all made wishes whenever we saw one. But of course, stars don't fall out of the sky. What we are really seeing is the result of sand grain or pebble-sized bits of interplanetary debris slamming into the Earth's atmosphere, usually at altitudes of around 50 to 75 miles. But how can something so tiny become so incredibly bright? First off, a little bit of terminology is needed. Out in space, we call these bits of interplanetary rubble meteoroids, and they can range in size from dust grain sized fluff to objects that are about a meter in diameter. Any bigger than that, and we start to call it an asteroid. They are composed of either rock, metal, or ice, or some combination thereof. All of this stuff orbits around the sun while cruising along at speeds of about 26 miles per second. However, once a meteoroid gets caught within the Earth's gravity well, it gets greatly accelerated, and by the time it enters the atmosphere, they can be traveling at speeds ranging from 25,000 to 160,000 miles per hour. At these velocities, meteoroids have a tremendous amount of kinetic energy, which is the energy obtained from their motion. Once an object slams into the Earth's atmosphere at such speeds, it's almost as though it has hit a brick wall and the meteoroid violently compresses a column of air out ahead of it. The gases in the air become flash heated to thousands of degrees for a second or two, and it's the glowing superheated air that you and I see as a streak of light across the night sky. More often than not, the meteoroid is vaporized, and the glowing streak of light is now called a meteor, which refers more to the phenomena of the glowing column of air than it does to a physical object such as a meteoroid. It's not so much the mass of these tiny meteoroids being converted into energy that's responsible for these bright displays. It's actually their high velocities imparting energy into a thin slice of the atmosphere, making it so hot that the air literally glows. It's cool to think that a tiny sand grain or pebble-sized bit of space debris has created a brilliant meteor streak that's usually less than three feet wide, yet several miles long. The average meteor that we see is produced by small particles of ice that burn up long before they can get to the ground, but on occasion, larger meteoroids made of rock and or metal do penetrate our atmosphere and portions of them can survive their descent. If they hit the ground, we call them meteoroids. And Arkansas is no stranger to these visitors from outer space. To date, there have been 15 meteorites found within the state. Nine of them are from unwitnessed falls, while another six were observed falls. The most famous of these occurred a little after 4 a.m. during the early morning hours of February 17th, 1930, in Paragould, Arkansas. One or more large rocks entered the Earth's atmosphere and blazed a bright trail across the sky over Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri before finally, under the stresses of heat and pressure, exploded in the atmosphere. Before the explosion was heard, the sky lit up like daylight. Moments later, there was the sound of three sonic booms, indicating that the object had broken up into at least three pieces. Then, when the fragments hit the ground, there was a thunderous quake of the earth. By this time, residents were wide awake. There were reports of livestock stampeding, and most people thought that an airplane had crashed. About a month later, residents found the largest piece of the rock responsible for all this chaos. The largest surviving fragment weighed over 800 pounds and had created a hole nine feet deep. It took five men, a team of horses, and three hours of work to unearth it. To this day, it is the second largest meteorite ever to be seen by witnesses to strike the earth and then recovered. It's now on display at UA Fayetteville. The smaller piece was found within hours of the impact by a local farmer. The object weighed about 80 pounds and created a hole some two feet deep. It now resides at the Smithsonian. The possible third piece has never been found. Generally, there are more faint meteors than there are bright ones, 
The fainter ones are made by smaller meteoroids, while the brighter ones are made by larger material. On occasion, you might see the, a meteor streaking across the sky that's brighter than the planet Venus, the third brightest object in our sky outside of the sun and the moon. We call these exceptionally bright meteors fireballs. And rather than being the tiny bits of interplanetary fluff, fireballs are meteoroids that range in size from a small pebble to a basketball to something over a meter across. Vivid colors, sonic booms, and smoke trails have all been reported by witnesses to these spectacular meteors. So where does all this meteoric material come from? About 5% of the meteoroid population is asteroid rubble, produced from the collision of large space rocks. The other 95% of meteoroid material comes from comets. The primary difference between asteroids and comets is their compositions. Asteroids are mostly stony and metallic, while comets are mainly made of ice, including water ice as well as frozen gases such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and methane, and are generally low in silicates. All of these ice and rock objects formed early on in the history of the solar system with asteroids forming closer to the sun where temperatures were too high for ice to exist, while the comets formed out on the fringes of the solar system, within the deep freeze, you might say, where volatiles could remain as solid ice. Comets usually hang around on the outskirts of the solar system while going around the sun in large, fairly circular orbits. Every now and again, one of them gets kicked out of its normal orbit and finds itself hurtling inwards towards the sun in an orbit that is now shaped like a highly elongated ellipse. When it gets about as far as 300 million miles from the sun, the ice and frozen gases begin to vaporize, producing long trails of debris composed of particles that range in size from dust grains to those that are about a centimeter in diameter. Even asteroids might behave in a similar way if they contain enough volatile material to produce outgassing when heated by the sun or if they get so close that the heat makes them fall apart. The trail of debris left behind in the wake of a comet stretches out along the orbital path of the parent body for millions of miles. Over time, due to interactions with the solar wind and the gravitational tugs of the sun and planets, the dust trail will soon spread out to form a meteoroid stream which can persist for thousands of years. If the Earth's orbit intersects or overlaps the stream at some point, then we get a meteor shower every year when our planet plows through the debris. But if you go outside on any dark moonless night away from human-made light pollution, you may see a handful of meteors every hour over the course of the entire night. We call these sporadic meteors and they probably represent bits of debris from long-lost comets whose centuries-old meteor streams are now so widely dispersed they can hardly be called streams any longer. Meteor showers, however, come from known comets and asteroids whose orbits and meteor streams are fairly well defined. To meet the definition of a meteor shower, the stream must contain enough material within it so that under optimal observing conditions, we would see an average hourly rate of at least 10 meteors per hour. I think when most people hear the words meteor shower, they visualize a steady torrent of meteor streaks throughout the night. In reality, that 10 to 20 meteors per hour is the average rate for many meteor showers. However, some showers are capable of producing as many as 60 to 100 or more meteors per hour. On very rare occasions, instead of a shower, we get a storm. The Leonid meteor shower, which occurs in mid-November, normally produces a rather tame 15 to 20 meteors per hour on a good night. But rather than a faint meow, Roughly every 33 years or so, the lion decides to roar. The most spectacular display in recorded history occurred in November of 1833 when an estimated 200,000 meteors per hour were seen to fall like rain from the sky for about four hours. The spectacle was so intense that it gave the illusion of the planet suddenly zooming off into space. Witnesses to these kinds of events have reported feeling the need to drop to the ground and hold on for dear life. There have been other storms from the Leonids over the years, most notably on November 18, 1966, when more than 140,000 meteors per hour were seen from locations in the American West. 
Historical accounts from here in Arkansas indicate that folks were seeing at least 400 meteors per hour. Then again, in 1999, 2001, and 2002, the Leonids continued to put on spectacular displays of over 3,000 meteors per hour. Now at this point, I know what you're thinking. I want to see this. Well, so do I. But predicting these kinds of things isn't easy. But by using advanced computer modeling of the meteor streams, the next expected Leonid meteor storm probably won't occur until the year 2034, when the Earth will again pass through a particularly dense stream of material. Meteors can be seen in any part of the sky, but during a meteor shower, if you were to trace back their lines of motion across the sky, you would see that there is a specific area within a given constellation from which they all appear to have originated. This point upon the sky is known as the shower's radiant, and most meteor showers are named for the constellation in which their radiant is located. For example, August's Perseid meteor shower has its radiant within the constellation of Perseus, while December's Geminids has its radiant in Gemini. In some cases, a shower gets its name from a star that appears close to the radiant point. May's Eta Aquariid meteor shower gets its name because the radiant is situated close to the star Eta Aquarii, found within the constellation of Aquarius. There's no real physical link between the constellation and the meteor shower. It's all an optical illusion. Just as the parallel lines of a railroad track appear to converge off in the distance, so too do all the meteor streaks appear to converge upon a point in the sky. Remember, a meteor shower is what happens when the Earth is moving through a meteoroid stream left behind in the wake of a passing comet. The particles that make up the stream are all moving in the same general direction as the parent body that produced them. So what the radiant is actually showing us is the pathway of the comet we have to thank for the meteor shower we are observing. It's easy to take the viewpoint that meteors and meteor showers and meteorites are nothing more than curiosities, transient events that have no real significance, but that would be greatly underestimating their potential. For example, we know that there's always a risk that a large asteroid or comet could collide with the Earth, causing either localized destruction to full-scale extinction level events. But there's another thing to consider. Asteroids and comets could, early on in the Earth's history, have very well either delivered some of the key ingredients needed for life to begin or, perhaps, have even brought life itself to the young planet. The results of a study of two meteorites that landed on Earth in 1998 was published in early 2018 by an international team of scientists at the Department of Energy's Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in the journal Science Advances. The team discovered salt crystals in both meteorites, and the crystals contained water, amino acids, hydrocarbons, and other organic materials. These crystals, with their prepackaged prebiotic material, could be viewed as potential delivery vessels for kickstarting life on a planet where conditions are just right. Is that what happened here on Earth billions of years ago? Do we owe our existence to some kind of cosmic express delivery system in the form of asteroids and comets. We may never really know, but it's something to think about the next time you look up in awe and wonder at the ephemeral streak of a meteor across the night sky.